In Havana, you can feel the change in the air. For the first time in decades, young Cubans aren't just hoping for a better future, they're sure it's coming. Like their parents and grandparents, they grew up under a suffocating US trade embargo. Now the window's opening. US President Barack Obama is moving to lift the embargo and change these Cubans' lives. Embassies have reopened, trade is recommencing. The isolation is finally ending. It's our revolution. Tonight, we reveal the astonishing story of how a small American family helped make this happen. Uh, one to two acres per cow per year. Their friendship with the Cuban dictator, Fidel Castro, made the unthinkable seem inevitable. It's changing govern our national policy, you know, that, that helped push us it. And he's the coolest world leader we've met with. <laughs> Because <laughs> there's so many of them that we've sat down with, you know. And we join them as they return to a new Cuba that's desperate to rise. You know, start with a little snowball that will hopefully turn into an avalanche. Like this? Am I doing it right? Upstate Minnesota is about as different from Cuba as you could imagine. At the source of the Mississippi, it's America's conservative farming heartland. Two dollars. Now three. I got two in the back 40. Oh, there's only three trains left. And now four. Yes, what's the way I want to give it up for it? Sweet. Ralph Kaler's family has been farming here since 1881. He and his wife Mina raised top-of-the-line Simmental cattle. Our boys are the fifth generation on the farm. Kind of our trademark that got us into all this has been uh, developing breeding cattle. And then I think a lot of our connections from our international stuff has been with uh, being farmers. You know, I think it's more of approach farmer to farmer. In 2002, the Kalers travelled to Cuba as part of a Minnesota trade delegation. Lisa Miller from Australian Television. Governor Jesse Ventura, a former world wrestling champion, defied the Bush administration's ban on state visits. How far away might we have some normalisation between the Who countries? Who knows, but this is a nice step. The Kalers brought down some of their prized cattle on the plane. This is a Minnesota Red. He's a bull and he will be he's Cubas now. We figured it'd be a good idea to bring Semitol down there since down here since they're extremely easy keepers. Castro had little interest in meeting big agribusinesses. Instead, he took a shine to Ralph and his sons Cliff and Seth. It's on a prueba, and they are a proof of the fact that our relations will be lasting relations. Y los irán and our trade will continue to increase. Ya estamos negociando for we are already negotiating con la futura generación with the future generation de agricultores norteamericanos. of American farmers. By chance, foreign correspondent was in Cuba filming the trade show. And what were your impressions of him? 
Um, a very intelligent man. He's very nice. He's very gentle. Um, he's just a very good person. And what did you think? Well, he was very pleasant and nice to us. You know, anytime you buy a political figure like that, you're just an awe. I mean, it was just amazing. Did it feel like history in the making? Not at the time. No. <laughs> <laughs> you know, looking back, yes, I can see that. But at the time, you're just, when you're that age, you're just, you don't realize what's going on. And I think, I mean, it's just, it, it also came on so suddenly that we didn't have time to really grasp the change. Castro even made the boys his guests of honor at a state concert. 13 years on, it's still a source of pride and some amazement for the parents. First contract with Cuba. <laughs> the friendship opened the way for Ralph to sell breeding stock and animal feed to Cuba. It was the first US cattle trade since 1959, when Castro toppled the former US-backed regime. Now, I gather you and your family got to know El Presidente quite well on your trip. We've met with uh, President Castro probably five or six times. Um, he's a man, when you get in to have that level of leadership that long, he does have a natural presence about him. He is very uh, dominating in a conversation because he's quite confident. But his friendship with the communist leader infuriated opponents of Castro in the U.S. We wanted to bring high quality. You know, we did get one letter from Florida, and the person was such a brave, daring soul. They put a fake address with no name on it and, you know, send us a picture of this man killed children. Well, how would you feel if he killed your children, you know? Cuban exiles in Florida might support the embargo, in Minnesota, farmers just want to sell their produce. Tanner Morris, Peterson, Minnesota. Guys, as we got found Eric, he's with uh, Australian Broadcasting. Hello. How are you, Jim? Ralph took me to meet some friends at a local cattle show. Do you think it's time the politicians ease off a bit? Why not? <laughs> you know, let's get over it. Mm. Time to move on. All of them, like Jim Rossman and his family, see the embargo as a Cold War relic. Why did we do that? Does it make any sense at all? So, Jim, are you a communist? Uh, am, I, am I a communist? No. I'm, I'm a Republican. <laughs> Maybe even worse. No. <laughs> no, no. Ralph did a brisk trade with Cuba until 2008, when the global financial crisis hit. He's now planning to take the family back to Cuba to rebuild connections and sign new contracts. So far, there's been more talk of normalising trade than actual changes. Exporters still have to negotiate a minefield of US restrictions before they can even start to deal with Cuba's stifling bureaucracy. But Obama's announcement has already led to a 10% jump in agricultural trade. Ralph believes the momentum will be unstoppable. As our trade opens up, Cuba will be in our top 20 trading partners quite easily, potentially top 10 in many of the main food products. As the Kalers waited on their visas, we flew down to Havana. I love to have you around, surround me. I get the fever that's so hard to bear. You give me fever. I was curious to see how much the city had changed since my last visit here in 2000. On the surface, at least, the changes were remarkable. And not what I was expecting. For a start, the old town of Havana is actually much more run down. Buildings are crumbling, potholes aren't being repaired, a sign of how badly the bureaucracy is faltering. <laughs> Oh, 
And here's what's really telling, you hardly see any of these. 15 years ago, Cuba was plastered with revolutionary and socialist billboards, just as TV was filled with back-to-back five-hour Castro speeches. Today, these are a fading novelty. Even the government seems to realise that people are now far more interested in money than revolution. And that's why you're seeing a lot more of these classic American cars from before the revolution. Wow. <laughs> They're being used as private taxis, so people are buying up these old cars from around the countryside, along with horses and carts, and bringing them here to make some income. The irony is that Havana actually looks more like a town from the 1950s now than it did at the turn of the century. I love Australia, I love the Congo. But what I find really remarkable is that there's now a real contemporary scene here. 15 years ago, a typical night out was beans and rice with rum. Not anymore. Now there's a swathe of uber-cool bars and restaurants buying food straight from farmers. This club called FAC, Fabrica de Arte Cubano, is a disused factory converted into an art, music and fashion venue. It's not for rich foreigners. It's for homegrown Havana hipsters. Raidel Garcia and Thomas Hernandez are local music producers. They're keen to show off this new scene to their American neighbours. It's bueno que bueno que ahora haya vista arriba de, de esta nueva sociedad cubana que realmente está más abierta a mentalidad que, que, que la tradicional, no, por así decirlo. Te digo algo. La comida cubana es riquísima, exquisita. Sí, yo le propongo a todos los ciudadanos americanos que vengan a deleitarse de la comida cubana. Sí, no hace falta McDonald's, no hace falta Burger King, no hace falta Domino's Pizza. But the thing I most wanted to see was life in the countryside. I headed down to Vinales, three hours west of Havana, to stay with Cuban farmers. Unlike in Minnesota, every part of rural life here is primitive and hard. Our hosts here, the Carrillas family, have to trek three kilometres through the bush to reach their farm. Fearing it would be too much for an Australian, they've brought me a horse. Oh, 
Well done, get going. Now, for the men, this is the start of a really long, hard day on the farm. But for the women in the household, well, they've already been up since well before dawn working. <laughs> Kenya Karillas and her daughters do the cooking and cleaning as well as helping out on the farm. There's no money for equipment, so it's completely labour intensive. Yes. Con este machetín se desmocha el pan miche para los puercos cuando no tienen comida. The grandfather Prudencio is 79, but still puts in a 12-hour day. No tengo dinero ni nada de eso porque yo lo que hago me lo como. Que es lo que me voy a llevar el día de mañana. Y ayudar a los demás. Que yo pueda ayudar, pobrecito. ¡Hurra! The farm has been in the family for three generations. That's unusual for Cuba. Most farms are big rural cooperatives owned by the state but that system is no longer working to feed the country. Cuba now has to import most of its food. The Carrillas are expected to give some of their crops to the state, but with barely 60 acres, they struggle to grow enough for themselves. Bueno, este es el arroz que nosotros sembramos todos los años. Cosechamos 40, 50, siempre sacos de arroz. Es para el consumo nuestro, no vendemos. Es para el consumo, para el negocio. Bueno, sí, me gustaría que los medios de trabajo de los campesinos se fueran un poco más, más desarrollados. The family live in a nearby village where they rent rooms to foreign tourists to make ends meet. Eddie. One moment. Come on. Come on here. Coming. <laughs> Miss Boss. It's possible looking. See, Chef. Arroz. Ah. Pepper. Yo. Oh, nice. Kenya may seem an ordinary housewife, but she's actually a trained biologist. These days, nobody can live on state wages. It's natural. <laughs> Organic. Organic. <laughs> <laughs> People say that in recent years things got harder because the Soviet Union disappeared and you know, the American embargo. How hard has life been in recent years? Claro que sí. La economía siempre estamos con la misma economía. No no tenemos derecho a aunque trabajemos a progresar porque si no podemos tener economía, mejorar con y comercializar con otros países por culpa del bloqueo y todo. La economía nos ha afectado a todos, a todos, a niños, a nosotros, a todos. Cubans were raised to see the U.S. as the enemy. Not just because of the embargo, but because the U.S. backed the brutal regime that Fidel Castro overthrew. Prudencio risked his life helping Castro's rebel fighters. What made you decide to fight the Batista regime? Porque yo tuve que salir de la granja de Rosario, en la edad de siete años, porque lo desalojaron allí en el pueblo y entonces nosotros vinimos para allí. So tell me, what was it like uh, when you were working for the revolution? Was it very dangerous? Peligroso. No, no se podía hablar. Si hablaba, te cortaban el pecuerpo, te guindaban una mano. Nosotros tenemos tres compañeros que están enterrados allá en Tortuga. Y siempre uno siente dolor que había otro que pudieran estar vivos y no están. Que no están a nosotros, pues lo llevamos en el pensamiento siempre. Qué alegría más grande. A eso fue una alegría para el pueblo de Cuba.
the communists would create their own litany of human rights abuses. The Cubans remain fiercely proud of the revolution and their independence. For half a century, they never buckled to the pressure of the US. Despite the economic problems, it's a remarkably joyous place. Family is everything here. All Kenya wants is a better future for her daughters. Are people uncertain about what's going to come in the future after the Castros are gone? Bueno, tenemos una juventud preparada, preparada desde niños, desde los niños, desde pequeños los niños se preparan en Cuba con las mismas ideas y luchar por las mismas ideas porque nosotros nos sentimos bien así. Two days later, the Kalers were at last flying into the van. Bienvenidos a Cuba. How are you? We're pretty excited. Oh, good, good. Glad to see you at last. We got everybody here. The whole clan had come. Nina, the boys Cliff and Seth, and their girlfriends Shelby and Bailey. Hey, hi Shelby. Hey Nina, how are you? Glad you made it. We got Gustavo, our translator, our guide. Ralph had organized a series of meetings with Cuban officials to capitalize on a bum's olive branch. We're going to have to have our mojito as a warm-up, though. You guys are going to join us, aren't If you? we must. Yeah, if you Just have to. Cool. Starting out to Cuba and a new trip. A new friend. The officials barred us from filming most of the visits, but we were allowed to join them at a state stud farm. It's looking good. Where the Cubans had a surprise for the Kalers. Fidel Castro may have been put out to pasture, handing the reins to his younger brother, Raul. But Minnesota Red is still going strong. That's uh, one that was in the video that you have when Cliff and Seth, that would have been in 2002. Yeah. And that's her daughter. Wow. And that's her son. So we're making, and you can see, they've adapted to the Cuban environment. They're taking very good care of them. It's, most cows don't make it to be 13 years old. We're quite surprised that that she's still going. For us, it makes us feel good. It shows our cattle can adapt. Mm -hmm. But to have this longevity, it shows it was the right selection genetically for Cuba to help improve their animals. And he expects her offspring to help transform Cuba's cattle stock. It's just a matter of the governments working out their uh, idiosyncrasies. <laughs> <That's what we're> <laughs> <laughs> Assuming that it will happen. Yeah. But things are looking good. For all the goodwill, the embargo remains in place. Until the US Congress agrees to lift restrictions, like the ban on direct banking, entrepreneurs like Ralph will struggle. It went really well. Uh, we've had some great meetings that we've definitely got interest. We heard from the Cubans. They love the products we introduced to them. Unfortunately, they're not buying them right now, and the Ministry of Foreign Development and, and, and Trade has made it very clear the lack of credit and the third country banking is being a huge barrier to them buying more. On the Kayla's last day in Cuba, we took them down to the farming town of Vinales. It's just Ralph. Oh. Glad to meet you. It seemed appropriate that these two very different, yet surprisingly similar families should meet. My son Cliff. Kenya. Prudencio had slaughtered and roasted one of their prized pigs. No food shortage was going to get in the way of Cuban hospitality. You love it. A meal like this, it doesn't get any better than, uh, than home barbecue. This is Ralph. Uh, Ralph Taylor. Very smooth. Looking sharp too, huh? 
As different as Minnesota and Cuba are, the country is still the country. I like the crunchy part. And nothing delights a farmer more than a meal that's being grown where All it's right. eaten. Wow! Wow! Yeah. <laughs> Between two good looking guys. Wow! So, Ralph, <laughs> what does coming here tell you about American Cuban relations? If we had U.S. officials here having this meal, I know what they would say when they left too. We need to end all the animosity and same with Cuban officials. If they were sitting at the tables of regular families, I think it would make it easier for both of them to get rid of, I don't know, for lack of a better word, stupid protocol or, you know, the some of the obnoxious rules. There are no illusions that trade will boom overnight or that politicians on either side will suddenly forget their animosity. It's going to be two steps forward and one step back as the US and Cuba start their awkward dance. But we call that in, in Minnesota the jitterbug. But after half a century of conflict, these neighbors are at last becoming neighborly. If our kids acted like our governments with the embargo, you would take them back in the room, give them a swat in their butt and tell them to straighten up and play better. Even, you know, heck, in a marriage you don't agree with your spouse on everything, but that doesn't mean you quit talking to them full time. You have your days where you may not, but uh, we need to normalize our relations, opening up trade, be a good neighbor, and keep things safe. So it's, I mean, it's going to be better for both countries. It's very good!